My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I want to do a video on implantable cardioverter defibrillators. These are defibrillators which can be implanted within the body. One of the most scary things in life is sudden death, sudden unexpected cardiac arrest causing death. Usually that happens because the heart, which is diseased in some way, starts malfunctioning, becomes irritable, goes into a very fast abnormal heart rhythm and that abnormal heart rhythm can then degrade into a rhythm called ventricular fibrillation where the heart is beating so fast and so ineffectively that it is incompatible with life and therefore the heart as a pump has failed and can't get the blood around and that is associated with this condition called cardiac arrest. And the one thing we know that seems to work in this setting when someone has a cardiac arrest or they go into ventricular fibrillation is the, um, if you can deliver an electrical current to the heart, so if you can shock the heart at that time, then there is a good possibility that you can get the patient out of ventricular fibrillation and get them to a rhythm which results in a more effective contraction of the heart and thereby save someone's life. So defibrillation is really, really important and perhaps the most effective way to save someone's life if they have a cardiac arrest. Now, the problem is that in the old days, you, and even now, we have these external defibrillators, which is a machine which is attached to a wall somewhere, and you have to go get the machine and then place that onto the patient's chest and deliver the shock. A, you know, a person can have a cardiac arrest and they may not be near a machine. B, a person needs to know how to use the machine, etc. So there are complexities with that. And of course, scientists have always been really interested in trying to work out whether you could get a device which can do this and you could potentially put the device in the person who is more vulnerable to having a cardiac arrest. And so the device could detect when the patient has developed ventricular fibrillation and at that point deliver a shock just by itself. And so in 1980, the first portable implantable defibrillator was developed and received FDA approval in 1985. The devices at that time were quite bulky devices. I have one of these here, but these aren't, this is probably not, this is probably even smaller, but it just goes to show you how bulky this device could be. But basically what they found was that you could actually implant this device under the chest wall here and feed some wires into the heart and the device would sit on the patient and in those vulnerable patients who were more likely to have a cardiac arrest because they had a diseased heart, the device would then detect the development of ventricular fibrillation and deliver a shock there and then. As time has progressed, these devices have become far more advanced and they're much smaller. And here is a more um, modern kind of device. If you compare it to, if you compare it to this, you will see that this is a lot smaller. It's definitely not as heavy as this. Um, but these are the current devices which can be implanted within the chest. Multiple studies have now shown that the that in a vulnerable patient, if you put in a defibrillator, then there is a substantial likelihood that the defibrillator will shock the patient out of the ventricular fibrillation and thereby save the patient's life. It is important to understand a few things about defibrillators, etc., and I'm going to talk about them. The first thing to say is that defibrillators, apart from delivering shocks, have lots of other very, very useful functions. The first thing to note is that they are very good monitoring devices. So when you have a defibrillator put in your chest, not only is that defibrillator just sitting there waiting for the development of ventricular fibrillation, uh, but it can also sit there and monitor what's going on with the heart rhythm. Uh, some people may have other heart rhythm disturbances like silent atrial fibrillation. And silent atrial fibrillation can increase the risk of strokes. So having one of these defibrillators will also pick up if a person is having atrial fibrillation, which the patient doesn't know anything about, and may help change management in that if you discover atrial fibrillation, you would give the patient anticoagulation, etc. So they're very good monitoring devices. The second thing to say is they can also act as pacemakers. So not only can they deliver the shock, uh, 
they can also work as pacemakers. So in a lot of patients who have heart disease, you can get a tendency to getting things like ventricular fibrillation, but you can also have a tendency to get very slow heart rates. In addition, sometimes some of the medications we use to prevent things like ventricular fibrillation from happening can cause the heart to go excessively slowly. So in that setting, one of these devices will actually detect the heart going too slowly and start pacing the heart and thereby stop it from going too slowly. It also then means that the patient can take those medications which will stop them going into ventricular fibrillation because actually what you don't want is for the patient to go into ventricular fibrillation so the device has to shock. You want to prevent that. You want this only as a last ditch resort uh, in case despite everything the patient does go into ventricular fibrillation and then this thing delivers a shock and saves their life but ordinarily you don't want this to be going off all the time so you want to try and reduce the likelihood of ventricular fibrillation happening with medications uh, but as I say the medications can sometimes push the heart too slow but this will stop the heart going too slow thereby allowing optimized medical therapy. Number three, it's also worth knowing that they can deliver other therapies. They don't just shock. What can sometimes happen is a lot of patients who before they go into ventricular fibrillation will go into a condition called ventricular tachycardia where their heart goes very, very fast but doesn't quite degrade into ventricular fibrillation. The device can detect when the patient is beginning to go into ventricular tachycardia and it can deliver a therapy called anti-tachycardia pacing where it will actually start trying to pace the heart at that time at a fast rate and therefore reduce the likelihood of this ventricular tachycardia developing into ventricular fibrillation. So it has three roles, you know, it can monitor, it can shock, it can pace and it can deliver other therapies to prevent the shock from happening. So I've said that there are all these good things about this device, um, but it is also important to balance that with some of the other problems that may be associated with the devices like this, because they may sound very attractive, but I just want to sound a word or two of caution. Firstly, the f thing to understand is that when these can devices deliver a shock, that shock can be extremely painful for the patient. So a lot of patients who have had shocks whilst the shock has been life-saving, has been extremely painful and people describe it almost like being hit in the chest by a donkey. That's how painful it is. It's a small price to pay if you can save, if you save the patient's life, but the problem is sometimes these devices can get it wrong. So let's say the way this device will try and work out whether a patient is going into ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation is based on how fast the heart is going. So if the heart is going above 188 beats per minute, then it automatically starts thinking, oh, we're dealing with ventricular tachycardia. I better start getting ready. I'm going to try and shock soon. But the heart could potentially go high for another reason. You may not have that abnormal heart rhythm. So if someone went into atrial fibrillation, for example, and the heart went really fast, then the device could get it wrong, think, oh, this patient's going into ventricular fibrillation and deliver a shock when actually the patient didn't need a shock because they were going into atrial fibrillation. So you can get inappropriate shocks with these. And sometimes you can also get unnecessary shocks with this, meaning that not every patient who goes into this thing called ventricular tachycardia will go into ventricular fibrillation, but the device can sometimes assume they will, and so may deliver a shock before the patient has a chance of coming out of the ventricular tachycardia itself. So those are inappropriate and unnecessary shocks. That's a problem with these devices. However, the algorithms are getting better all the time, and most of the times the doctors will give patients medications to stop the heart going fast anyway, to minimize the risk of that but it's something you need to be aware of. The other problem, of course, is that every time one of these devices does shock, apart from the trauma for the patient, uh, because it can be unpredictable, it can be very painful, is also the fact that the battery life does get depleted with every shock. So you put them in, but you don't want them to shock ideally, unless it was absolutely necessary. The insertion of a defibrillator is not without risk. The risk is only small, but it is an invasive procedure. It does involve putting a wire into the heart and you are then stuck with it because the wire gets embedded within the heart muscle and it's not easily removable. So once you get the wire in, 
it just stays there and you are now left with a foreign body in your chest. And the problem with foreign bodies is that they can sometimes in unlucky patients get infected. And then it's a real nightmare because if a foreign body like this gets infected, then the only way you can clear the infection is to remove the foreign body. But because the wires that, are, that enter the heart can get embedded into the heart muscle, it can be quite difficult to remove the foreign body. So that's another thing just to be aware of. Having a defibrator does have a bearing on what happens in terms of quality of life for the patient. Uh, the most important thing is driving. If you have a defibrillator, you know, when patients uh, have to, are faced with driving restrictions, certainly anyone who has a group two license, a GB license, is not uh, going to be allowed to drive. And anyone who has an ordinary driving license may be faced with lengthy bands every time the device shocks, unless the doctor can do something to minimize it shocking again or reducing the risk of ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. It is also really important to understand that something like this can have a huge psychological impact for the patient and their families. You know, patients are a little bit on edge. They're always worried. And if they've had a bunch of shocks, they can be left really traumatized by this. And therefore, in my own practice, before anyone has one of these, I tend to get them to go and see a psychologist. And it's important for them to work with a psychologist, both them and their families. The next thing is expense. These devices are quite expensive. In America, I think they, charge, they cost about $38,000 for one of these devices. Uh, and that doesn't include the cost of putting the device in and monitoring it. In this country, it's about 10,000 pounds for one of these devices. So they are expensive devices. I think it's also under important to understand that a device like this is only effective in preventing sudden death or reducing the risk of sudden death from ventricular fibrillation. But people can die of other heart rhythm disturbances. People can die of asystole. People can die of something called electromechanical dissociation or pulseless electrical activity. And so in those patients who have a very, very weak heart, there's a much greater likelihood that their heart is going to fail, their heart is going to throw off heart rhythm abnormalities. And so putting one of these could just simply delay the inevitable and in doing so cause a huge deal of trauma both to the patient and the patient's family. So those people who have very weak hearts who are really struggling, in those people it's probably not a good idea because the heart is so weak, those patients may not necessarily have any form of quality of life. And then you put one of these in and it shocks. And because you haven't, because the heart is so weak, you can't do anything about correcting the weakness so the heart will shock again and shock again and that can make the patient's last few days extremely traumatic. So people tend to be reluctant to put these in and those patients who are really unwell and who are going to die anyway. If you have a patient who has a terminal condition, for example, then sometimes it's a good thing to try and switch these off or not put them in in the first place because again, the only real thing with these is that they prevent sudden death. If a person is going to die anyway, then uh, all you do is you delay the inevitable and cause the patient great distress. It is worth knowing that you can switch these off even though they're in. So whilst they're working all the time, I think it's important also to understand that one of these devices is only effective in reducing the risk of sudden death from ventricular fibrillation. But people can have other heart rhythm disturbances which can also lead to sudden death. So it's not a fail-safe thing. You, you know, people can have electromechanical dissociation or asystole, and in those patients, the device is not going to be beneficial. It's also important to understand that some people just have very diseased, very weak hearts, and the heart starts failing, and the mechanism of death in those patients is just progressive heart failure where they're becoming more in, unable, they're swelling up with fluid, they're just getting more and more breathless and they really have no quality of life. In those patients, this is not a good idea because those patients are going to die anyway. And all this does is delays the inevitable but causes great trauma to the patient and patient's family in doing so. It is worth knowing that you can turn these off even though the, it's inside the body. Putting a large magnet on the defibrillator will disable it and will stop it from going off.
So that's just worth knowing about. Given all of the considerations that I've mentioned, it is important therefore to offer the device to the right patient. And we have to be very careful and we have to make sure that the patient is mentally in a good place and can understand why they're having the device and that they can deal with it psychologically. But also we want to give them to patients who have a good, a better prognosis, who don't have a very, very diseased heart and in whom these devices will go off only once in a while, but could potentially be life-saving. There are two types of situations in which a defibrillator would be useful. And the first is primary prevention, which means that nothing bad has happened to the patient, but we think that they're at a very high risk of having sudden death because they have a diseased heart. So let's say a person has had a big heart attack and you can't do anything to try and strengthen the heart back up. So the heart has been left very damaged. People like these are patients who have an ejection fraction of less than 35% after a heart attack, for example, and that ejection fraction hasn't improved despite good treatment. In those patients, you can put in a defibrillator as primary prevention, meaning they haven't had a cardiac arrest, but we think that they could be at risk, so let's put a defibrillator in just to prevent that eventuality. The second group of patients are patients who, for, uh, in whom it's inserted for secondary prevention. In those patients, something bad has happened and therefore you are now putting one of these devices in to prevent another such event from happening. A common scenario is, for example, that athlete who is suddenly playing football suddenly has a cardiac arrest. They are successfully resuscitated and nothing can be done to reverse what may have caused their cardiac arrest, in which case you put one of these in to prevent the likelihood of them having another cardiac arrest, or not prevent the like, but, but counteract the consequences of another cardiac arrest. So a footballer called Fabrice Muamba, he had this, you know, he was playing football, had a cardiac arrest, he was resuscitated, and now he has one of these devices in to prevent this from happening again. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how defibrillators are put in. The procedure is relatively straightforward. It's done under local anesthetic. The patient is generally not put to sleep. What we do is we give the patient some anesthetic here. You make a little pocket with your fingers. Okay, and this is not painful for the patient because of the anesthetic, but you can make a pocket with the fingers. The pocket will house this. So the pocket will house the actual device, which has the battery in it. And then once you've made the pocket, what you do is you try and puncture one of the veins under the collarbone. Once you've punctured the vein, you can actually slide a wire to the heart under X-ray guidance. And the wire looks like this here. So this is a wire. This can be fed in to the heart like this under X-ray guidance, and it'll sit there. And you see that on X-ray. And then all you do is you attach this to the, the device here, like this, put the device in, stitch up, and that is the defibrillator done. And the procedure can take any can take one hour, 30 minutes to an hour to put in. It is then tested to make sure it works. And for that, the patient is put to sleep to see that it will shock the patient out. And the patient can then go home usually by the next day. The battery of the defibrillator can easily last between five to eight years after which the wires are left in, but simply what we do is we disconnect the, pa the, disconnect the battery, you open the patient up, again, just there, the nick, you take this out, it's still attached, you disconnect this, put a new one in, and stitch up. And that's how it's done. So I hope you found this useful. In the future, I will do a video on what it is like to live with a defibrillator and what, how it can affect our quality of life. But in general, in those people who are at a high risk, they're a very good idea because they, they are the kind of ultimate last ditch resort to prevent the risk of sudden death. I hope you found this useful and I would be so grateful if you'd consider sharing it with anyone who may be being considered for a defibrillator and is a bit worried about what they may involve. And uh, once again, thank you so much for all that you do for me. All the best.